Case Customer Creations is sponsored by Bits and Bits. Use the code JBates to save 10% off your next router bit or CNC bit purchase at bitsbits.com. Good morning, everybody. This is the blanks. Actually, this is the blanks for the uh, stool tops. And this is a bunch of extra milled material to the same length for some of the rails. Not enough to do all the rails, but a lot to get started. So I'm making a bunch of stools to go around the farm table that I made previously for my outdoor kitchen. Yesterday I came in here and started milling up some eight quarter poplar. I bought a bunch of eight quarter poplar just because I found it at a, at a good price. So I bought about 200 board feet. That's more than what I need, but you know, you find wood at a good price, you buy more than what you need. I do anyway. I uh, went through the whole milling process, getting everything nice and square for sides and also rough cut to a little bit of an oversized length. And that's what I'm left with to start today. I'm going to mill, mill, I'm going to glue four of these pieces per bar stool top. So it's about 14 and a half inches in both dimensions in this orientation. And that'll give me a slightly oversized blank that I can still run through the planer once these are all glued up to kind of skip plane them down to their final size. And then I can cross cut and rip them to their final size, which should be about 14 and a half inches. I'm sorry, 14 inches square. The rough blank is 14 and a half. A little bit of curiosity before we continue with the build. So this is my preferred method of applying glue. One of these little four inch small diameter paint rollers. And these last a long time, so long as you can stop them from drying out. If, if this maintains uh, high enough moisture content, it'll basically last forever until you wear out the roll, the little roller or the little nap from actually putting glue on, which has never been an issue for me. Uh, the, the problem, like I said, is stopping it from drying out. So I've got a little dollar shoe box. You can get these from Walmart, itty bitty shoe box. Got a little piece of hardwood in the bottom to elevate the handle and just a little bit of glue. And this seems to do the trick as far as lasting quite a while uh, and not drying out. So curious what you guys use. I, I've tried the rubber rollers that attach to the glue bottles, but then you got to wash the rubber roller. With something like this, it basically lasts forever. So long as you stop this thing from drying out. And um, yeah, anyway, curious about what you guys use for that. This stock over here is stock that I have left over from uh, the top panels. So when I cut the top panels, all the top panels and the rails need to be 14 and a half inches long in their rough state. So that's what all of this is, 14 and a half inches long. But a lot of this has these nasty voids or knots or something to where I couldn't use them as a top piece, top panel piece, but they're already cut to the perfect length. So that's perfect stock for the rails. I don't have enough, so I'm gonna have to mill up a bunch more material. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is when I was doing all these, the eight that are going to be on the long side of the table are 14 and a half inches square as far as the top down view. But the two pieces or the two stools that are going to be on the ends are 22 inches in length. So I went ahead and glued those together as well, wherever they're at. And I have some extra material here, which is plenty enough for the rails. So I'm good on the rails for those. I need to go ahead and mill up some more material for the rest of the rails. And while I'm at it, might as well take care of all... 60 bajillion legs that I need to cut. I have a good long relationship with half lap joints. I love them. Half lap joints are really easy to make and really, really strong. They probably have one of the highest ratios of 
low effort and high strength. Yeah, there's, there's stuff that's stronger out there. Let's just say like a big dovetail joint. It's probably much stronger, but the effort needed to create it is also much higher. So there's this, this really good ratio, low effort, high strength. My preferred tooling of choice is the dado stack here at a table saw. Of course, you can use many other tools to create a half lap joint. Let me bring you in closer and show you a few tips that may help the process for you. When using the dado stack and a table saw, all of the cuts for a half lap joint are cross cuts, meaning you're cutting across the grain. Therefore, we're using the miter gauge set at whatever angle your, your half laps are. All of mine are at 90 degrees. I have a sacrificial fence on the miter gauge and because we're using a dado stack, we're moving a ton of material fast. And I don't want all that material blowing past the sacrificial fence, blowing past at me, creating all kinds of dust. I want the dust collection on the table saw to do the job. So I put a shroud basically behind where the uh, dado stack goes through the sacrificial fence. Now I used a screw right here, a metal screw and table saw blades obviously don't get along well but you'll know that I put this higher obviously than the height of the dado stack and I'm not going any higher. I mention that because sometimes people see this and kind of cringe that there's a screw that close to the blade. Blade's not going any higher. That's, that's totally fine. But as I push this through, this bigger piece being in line with the blade and also wider than the dado stack, not blade, dado stack, uh, all of it, it's a dust shroud. All of the dust will be contained into the table rather than blowing around. Also, you'll notice a red line right here. I struck a line on my fence that is the center line-ish of the arbor where the dado stack is attached to. That way, I know without leaning over the front of all of this right here, I can stay on the back side and push the material through and very easily know that I'm past where I need to stop for my travel. So I can very easily not push too far, basically. To get a precise half lap, you need two precise setups in your tooling. Number one, you need the height to be exactly half the thickness. That way, when you put a half lap joint together, uh, it, it all lines up perfectly with no gaps. I'll show you that in a second. You also need to know the distance traveled to make a perfect half lap joint on the interior of your piece. Making half lap joints on the end that's pretty easy because really all you have to do is take your material width, put it up against the fence, line it up with the outside of this tooth, lock the fence down, and that is the perfect distance to push this material through. You do it on two of them, and assuming you have the height set up properly, then you have a perfect half lap joint. So how do we dial in the height? The way I do it is first off, I keep a couple boards that are the exact same dimensions as my material that I'm going to be using for the joinery. Uh, test boards as well as another couple smaller pieces and I first take two of them set it up against the miter gauge and push it through so it just nibbles a little bit I start with the, the dado stack a little bit below center just by eye push this through and then if you flip one of these upside down and try and push these together if you physically cannot get them together that means you need to raise the blade just a tiny amount. Remember, everything that you do to the blade adjustment is doubled because you're putting it on two pieces. So let's just say you need to raise it uh, one eighth of an inch. All right, let's just say you have a one eighth of an inch gap, then you only need to raise it one sixteenth of an inch. Uh, but anyway, you sneak up on the height until these are perfect. Now what I call perfect is if they're laying on the table like this, pushing down on one of them, you can see that the top one is gonna move this board. There's enough friction to move that board. But if I just hold it in place, there's also, uh, they're also at the perfect height to where it just seats properly. Once these are together, there will be no gaps all the way around and both top surfaces, depending on which side of the joint you're holding, should be nice and perfectly flush. That's how you know that the blade height is set properly and also the blade width is set properly because you can do a test on the ends right here. Now that everything is confirmed, you can also make what's what I call a kerf maker style stop block. You can do this before testing on the ends of the boards or after, it doesn't really matter. But basically you take the piece of material that is the exact same size as your test boards or as your uh, joinery boards, put it up against the fence and line it up so that these teeth, uh, uh, these outside teeth are perfectly flush on this space. Then you can run it through to remove just the width of the dado stack. And what that gives you is this distance down here, which is the distance traveled necessary to use this dado stack to make a perfect half lap in the beginning 
or I'm sorry, in the uh, middle of your material. One uh, really quick thing that I forgot to mention, and that is I'm using a miter gauge with my fence. Now, if you may be new to woodworking, you may initially see this and say, ah, uh, 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 I heard you're not supposed to use the miter gauge and the fence. It's just a recipe for kickback. There's more to it than just that. You should not use the miter gauge with the fence to create a corner here for your material if you are removing material and that material will be dropped between the blade and the fence. Nothing in this case is being trapped. I'm just nibbling away material as I go in and nothing is being trapped into the blade. What you don't want is to remove material or make a cut so that it creates an off cut right there that dangles down in between the blade and the fence. That right there is the recipe for disaster. One more quick tip for you, and I, I promise you I'm about to start making some sawdust. <laughs> is find a spot in your shop, any one of the walls, just find a spot that can be seen from everywhere in your shop, wherever you're working, and either put up a chalkboard or put some chalkboard paint on the wall, and that way you can have really, really visible notes no matter where you are in your shop. For me, on my back wall, I put a chalkboard up there, and I can tell you that this is a pile of 40 legs, 52 short reels and eight long reels. I didn't know those numbers, but I wrote them down over there and I can see that. So that, that's something that's really, really helped me as far as common dimensions that you're about to use on your project. Write them down where you can see them no matter where you're at. You don't have to go find them in the clipboard or something like that. That was a lot of repetition. My fingers are already talking to me, but we've got a lot more to do. Uh, those are all these cuts. It's really difficult to mess those up. That's, although I have done it, <laughs> uh, that's, those are the easy cuts. Now we gotta focus our attention towards the interior cuts. And these legs will get two more half lap cuts for each leg. And the first one is really easy because it's on the same face as the previous cut. It's just lower down below. So when we assemble, we'll have a rail up top and a rail down below on that same face. So that means the easier of the two is about to be cut. All I need to do is put the half lap down, and then so long as my setup is done properly, I just run through the process with the half lap down. Then I need to make a half lap on the outside faces to connect these, these uh, uh, leg assemblies, I guess you could say. And that's where I need to really pay attention because I need to make half of them on the right side and half of them on the left side, otherwise I'll have two left feet. And you know that's not gonna work. So I'm gonna cut the easy one first. I know that this lower rail, uh, let's see, the distance from the top of the rail to the floor is four inches. So that means I need to make sure that the left side of my dado stack is four inches from the fence. And then I can use the Curve Maker style stop block. More testing per usual. I have the fence set four inches away from the outside of the dado stack. That means on my last cut, it'll be up against the fence and that'll establish the top of the rail to the ground. Where do I start? That's where this Curve Maker style stop block comes into play. Remember, this is the same thickness, the same dimensions as the material we're working with. And we started by putting it up against the fence, lined up on this side of the blade so that we're just, we're just absolutely perfect here. You can, your fingertips can feel thousands of an inch difference. So you get it absolutely perfect, easy to do. Uh, with your fingertips and you remove just the width of the blade that leaves us with the distance traveled right here so you make your first cut against the distance traveled pinch that up against the, the fence here remember we don't want anything loose to be flopping around so we'll start here remove the stop block make our cut then work our way into the fence and make our second cut and right off the bat if you use this method i almost i, I guarantee you it's going to be too tight and that's what my first test was because it's a precise setup, a very, very, very precise. And what that doesn't take into consideration is the glue we're using, which is a modern PVA glue. It's water-based, water swells the joint and expands the joint. So if it's really tight and I have to struggle to put this together with my hands, uh, not using a mallet, but I'm struggling to put it together with my hands, then I know it's gonna be crazy tight when I add glue. So the way we add a little bit of width, just a tiny amount, we can dial this in, is by adding tape to this Curve Maker style stop block. So you add thicknesses of tape until you get the fit that you want. In my case, I'd add three layers of masking tape. It's just a few thousandths of an inch. 
But now when I made my first cut, run this through, second cut, run it through, I'm left with a fit that is loose enough that I can get it together with just one thumb pressure, right? But tight enough to where that's not gonna, this is a cantilevered force right here. That's not gonna fall against gravity, right? So I'm not holding it in an awkward location to where, yeah, right, it's not gonna fall apart like that. This is against gravity, cantilevered force. This should fall out if it's too loose. Tight enough to easily seat it, easily remove it. And you can dial that in with this uh, tape method on the Curve Maker style stop block. Everything is dialed in. I'm ready to rock and roll. We've got a lot more to cut, so I'm gonna get these done. All of the front and back assemblies are complete, uh, but before we can glue this to the bottom of the seat blanks, which are over there, and I still need to work on those, this top surface needs to be absolutely flat and perfect. It's not right now because of a little bit of glue squeeze out, some joinery here and there. Uh, something on just about all of these is just a little bit proud here or there. So the easiest way to just clean it all up at the same time is to clamp them to a level and then put the level up against the table saw fence and trim off just a sixteenth of an inch. This will leave me a nice, perfectly flat top surface. With the top panels out of the clamps, I can skip plane them at the planer to get them to a consistent thickness rip them at the table saw to get them to their final width, and then also at the table saw with a cross-cut sled, cross-cut them to their final length. And now we're ready for the last bit of joinery, which is two big rabbits. And these rabbits are going to be parallel with the grain on all of the seats, and they will allow the seat to connect on top of and inside of the front and back assemblies. Two cuts at the table saw to establish this joint. Both of those with the regular table saw blade is much faster than setting up the dado stack to hog out all of this material. Always be on the lookout for opportunities as they come up. We have two different lengths of stools. We have four short length and two long length, which means we have two different sizes for this trash, this off cut that just happened from those two cuts to make a rabbit rather than turning these into sawdust. And now I can set these to the side, probably for tomorrow, to turn them into, I don't know, two cheese boards, two serving trays, two somethings that would otherwise have been sawdust. So be on the lookout for opportunities. I'm using a fast setting glue, so I think it's going to be easier to break the glue up into two stages. I'll put these rails in place just for positioning. They're dry. I'll not clamp them or glue them right now. Instead, I'm going to start with gluing the top in place. I'll put a little bit of glue on top of the rails, roll it out, set the top panel in place, add some clamps to hold it down, and then one long clamp to pinch it together. And I think, I think I'll just let that sit. Then I can come back once that's dry and add glue to each one of these joints one at a time. I'm trying to streamline the process of finishing all this up and uh, this assembly table with a bunch of dog holes is super handy for these types of clamps to hold basically anything down, stop it from moving. Uh, but first up is the belt sander. It won the sanding competition so it gets to sand all of the, uh, all of the joinery faces or the joinery where the pieces are intersecting just smooth everything up together. Then I'll use a palm sander to kind of knock off the sharp corners all the way around. And then once I have two adjacent faces nice and complete, and I know that the outside corner of the leg is done, I'll use a small chamfering bit to create a chamfer, uh, not all the way up the entire length of the leg, but just kind of on the inside to kind of match the uh, style of the farm table base. Once those are all done, then I can sand the top complete and then put a chamfer all the way around the bit. Then, and only then, I can take these outside and spray some General Finishes Tuscan Red Milk Paint, which is what we've been using for everything on our outdoor kitchen. And hopefully by that time, it should be time for a steak. Like usual, that took longer than I thought it would. 
Uh, if I was to do this over again, I would definitely do it, yes, but I would use dominoes. Half lap joints are fun and they're easy, uh, but dominoes would just would have been way faster. Uh, you kind of can't even see the half lap joints anyway. I mean, you can in person. I don't know how much it's showing up on camera, but you, you can definitely see them in person if you really try to look. You have to kind of know that they're there. Uh, I also don't know how well that chamfer is showing up uh, on the, the edge of the legs here. But it matches the table quite well. The table's got that same chamfer style. So I really like, I really like this whole setup. Like everything about it. This is um, this is such a fun space. I love this contrast. I love this color combination. Tuscan red general finishes milk paint with uh, slate paper stone tops. It just matches everything that we've got so well. It ties everything together. And this whole space has turned out quite quite well. Got the fire pit seating over there. Also. There's a little sneak peek for you. I put rockers on the bottom of my uh, my bench that started my business. And it's nice. It's really nice. Whoops. Zoom out, not in. Anyway, that's it for this project. One step closer to the steak I mentioned earlier. <laughs> and uh, also entertaining and having a good old time out here. Love it. Space is turning out quite well. That's it for this one. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. I never ask for thumbs up, but hey, why not? Uh, if you want to stay up to date with everything that I publish, go to my website, jacecustomcreations.com slash newsletter. Sign up for my email newsletter. You'll get a coupon code for uh, all of my plans that I sell on my website. You guys take care. Have a great day, and I'll talk to you in the next video.